Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues and friends, good morning and good afternoon for those joining us from uh, the Middle East. And welcome to this uh, event of the UN Committee on the Exercise of the Labor Rights of the Palestinian People. Uh, this event is uh, held in cooperation with the Organization of Islamic Cooperation on the impact of Israeli settlement policies on the Palestinian Recording in, progress. in Jerusalem. First and foremost, uh, let me inform that uh, Arabic interpretation uh, will be provided at this meeting, and participants might select uh, the English or Arabic channel on Zoom or on UN Web TV, depending on which platform they are following uh, this meeting. My name is uh, Sheikh Nyan, the chair of the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights for the Palestinian People and permanent representative of Senegal to the UN. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to express our appreciation uh, for your presence here today. Since its creation in 1975, the committee has worked to promote the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people including their right to self-determination as provided by international law and as enshrined in the UN Charter. And our mandate is regularly renewed by the GA. Our activities on the question of Palestine aim at mobilizing efforts to end the Israeli occupation and to achieve the realization of the truth solution and also of a sustainable and just peace. And as per its mandate, our committee raises awareness internationally on the question of Palestine, and also on, on, on the challenges faced daily by the Palestinian people. Uh, and in so doing, we regularly engage with civil society in the OPT in Israel and elsewhere. Today's conference on the question of Jerusalem is an annual event organized in cooperation with the OIC, a long-standing partner of uh, our committee. At the opening of this event, we have the honor of having among our speakers His Excellency Mr. Khaled Khiari, United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, as well as Ambassador Ali Boutali, who will be speaking on behalf of the Assistant Secretary General for Palestine and Al-Quds Affairs of the OIC. We will also be joined by uh, His Excellency Mr. Riyad Mansour, Permanent Observer of the Observer State of Palestine to the UN. And our panelists will then deliver the presentation on the topic of this conference. And after that, a Q&A discussion will follow. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today we will examine, as I mentioned earlier, the impact of Israeli settlements on East Jerusalem, including institutional and socio-economic challenges for Palestinian residents. We will also discuss recommendations for measures linked to the UN database of businesses facilitating Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory, compiled by the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And also ways to address structural discrimination in the city, including through global platforms of solidarity, those ways also will be considered. Finally, our panelists will delve into US policy and legislation on the question of Palestine. Let me now welcome today's panelists. Let me start by uh, Mr. Munir Luseba. Mr. Munir Luseba is a human rights lawyer and an assistant professor at Al-Quds University's Faculty of Law. 
the director and co-founder of uh, Al-Quds Human Rights Clinic, the first accredited clinical legal education program in the Arab world, and the director of the Community Action Center in Jerusalem. He had a number of research and services projects that focus on forced displacement, international law, and Jerusalem. We also have Dr. Doug Baum, who is an American Friends Service Committee Director of Economic Activism. Dr. Baum is the co-founder of Who Profit from the Occupation, co-founder also of the Coalition of Women for Peace in Israel. Dr. Baum is a feminist scholar, teacher, and she has been active with various groups in the Israeli anti-occupation and democracy movement, and has also headed the Economic Activism for Palestine program of Global Exchange. The third panelist is uh, Mr. Josh Robner, who is an American author, political analyst, and activist. He served as the National Advocacy Director of US Campaign for Palestinian Rights, and worked to end the US military aid to Israel and on other policy initiatives. He co-founded Jews for Peace in Palestine and Israel in 2000, which has since merged with Jewish Boys for Peace. Mr. Urubner is a former analyst in Middle East Affairs at Congressional Research Service. He is currently the director of government relations at the Institute for Middle East Understanding. The fourth, last and not least, panelist is uh, Mrs. Nu Arafe. Mrs. Nu Arafe is a fellow at the Malcolm H. Carnegie Middle East Center, where her work uh, focuses on the political economy of the MENA, MENA region, business state relations, and the Palestinian Israeli conflict. Prior to that, uh, Mrs. Arafe served as the policy fellow of Al Shakaba, the Palestinian Policy Network, where she conducted research on the political economy of the OPT. Mrs. Arafe also previously worked at the Palestinian Economic Policy Research Institute, MAS, where her research focused on issues related to private sector development and the reconstruction uh, process in Gaza. She has also worked on the Sustainable Development Goals and socio-economic policy analysis. Mrs. Arafe will help us in moderating the event and keep the discussion lively and engaging. I know she has all those skills. I'm sure she will do it perfectly. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Israeli policies of demographic change, particularly through the establishment of resettlement, forced displacement, and ongoing house demolition in East Jerusalem. In addition to the tight control of Palestinians' daily movements and actions, are making Palestinians, including women, feel trapped in isolated enclaves and excluded from the rest of the West Bank and the world. Israeli Israel uh, curtailed Palestinian ability to find employment and housing with a heavy socioeconomic impact on their daily lives and imposes control through an intricate system limiting access to the Jerusalemite ID and residency rights. You all remember that on the 15th of May, we commemorated the 75th anniversary of the Nakba with a high level meeting of the committee and a special commemorative event in the GA Hall aimed at informing and reminding of the history of and of the plight of Palestine refugees. Unfortunately, this process of dispossession has continued unabated. For a decade now, settlement expansion, eviction, and demolition of Palestinian homes linked to increasingly high levels 
of settler violence have ravaged through the OPT, including its Jerusalem. The city has become a flashpoint and a symbol of the systematic, meticulous attempt by Israel, the occupying power, to entrench the occupation and irreversibly change the demographic fabric of the city. Recently, the fourth eviction of uh, the Sub Laban family, who had been living in East Jerusalem for generations and had fought in the Israeli courts since 1978 against the eviction from the home in the Muslim quarter of the world, old city, has triggered international condemnation and calls on the occupying power to halt these illegal practices. I was informed that Mr. Rafat Sublaban, a member of the executive family, has joined the meeting today and might be able to participate in the Q&A discussion uh, to share uh, the personal experience of the family. The committee will continue to underscore that Israel, Israeli settlements in the, in the occupied West Bank, including Jerusalem, and demolition and seizures of Palestinian homes and structures, all those violations are flagrant uh, and are challenging and uh, opposing the UN resolution and international law. They are a major obstacle to the achievement of a strategic solution and of a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace. Over several years now, the GA, the Security Council, and the Secretary General have reaffirmed that any action taken by Israel, the occupying power, to impose its laws, jurisdiction, and administration on the holy city of Jerusalem are illegal. The committee considers that negotiated solution on the status of Jerusalem that takes account of the political and religious concerns of all sides is a prerequisite for a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and lasting peace in the entire region. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, let us therefore start our panel discussion. I will give the floor to each of the panelists for short briefings on their respective topics and areas. After the interventions, I will open the floor for comments by committee members and observers, followed by Q&A discussion with questions and comments uh, coming from the wider audience. While participation in the virtual platform, Zoom is limited to committee member and observer states, as well as the panelists, the public can watch the event on UN Web TV and send their questions via the committee Facebook, Twitter account, in the email dpr slash meeting at un.org or by WhatsApp. And the number of WhatsApp is plus one six four six four two one zero five seven I repeat for the WhatsApp number, plus one six four six four two one zero five seven nine. We encourage participants to tweet using the hashtag rights for Palestine. So to start, I'm going to have the great honor inviting uh, His Excellency Mr. Khaled Khiari, UN Assistant Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. Uh, to share his opening remarks. ASG Hairi, welcome, and I have the pleasure to see you, and uh, you have the floor. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, good afternoon. For those who are not uh, in New York, uh, excellencies, uh, dear moderator and panelists, uh, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to address the International Conference on the question of Jerusalem, an event which has become an annual tradition entitled the impact of Israeli settlement policies on the Palestinian population in Jerusalem. We thank the United Nations Committee on the exercise of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people and the OIC for this timely initiative. 
The topic of this year's conference is particularly relevant as we continue to witness the volatile security situation in the occupied Palestinian territory, including the deadly escalations and confrontations that have taken place in Gaza and the unoccupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem. The scale of violence and scope of destruction we have witnessed in recent weeks, including widespread settler violence against Palestinians and their property in villages across the central and northern West Bank, as well as little attacks by Palestinians against Israeli civilians are alarming. Israel's ongoing expansion of settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory, including the advancement of thousands of housing units, evictions and land confiscation is of grave concern. In addition, recent amendments by the Israeli government to the settlement planning process that are likely to expedite advancements are a worrying move in the wrong direction. Settlements contravened international laws, entrench the occupation and increase frustration and friction points that drive violence and conflict while undermining the rights of the Palestinian people to self-determination. They are a major obstacle to the prospect of a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace based on a viable two-state solution in line with the United Nations Security Council resolutions. As reiterated by the Secretary General, United Nations Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process and Council members on numerous occasions Israel must cease all settlement activity immediately and fully respect its obligations under international law. We note with concern the recent eviction of a Palestinian refugee's family from their home in the Muslim quarter of Jerusalem's old city. You made reference to this case, Mr. Chair, where they had been living since 1953. The most recent report of the Secretary General on the implementation of Security Council Resolution 2334 of 2016 highlighted that some 970 Palestinians, including 424 children in occupied East Jerusalem face eviction cases in Israeli courts. Israeli demolition of Palestinian homes and property in East Jerusalem and Area C also continues to due to the lack of Israeli issued building permits, which are nearly impossible for Palestinians to obtain. This leaves Palestinian families in the limbo of dispossession and denial of rights. We reiterate the call upon the government of Israel to immediately end the demolition of Palestinian owned property and to prevent the possible displacement and forced eviction of Palestinians in line with its international obligation and to approve plans that would enable those communities to build legally and address their development needs. Israel as the occupying power has an obligation to protect Palestinians and their property from acts of violence by armed settlers and to ensure that perpetrators are held accountable. As the Secretary General has noted, dangerous and hateful rhetoric, provocative actions and incitements by all sides have continued. Such conduct, which has the potential not only to increase tensions, but also to spark more violence, must be unequivocally rejected by all. Furthermore, the status quo at the holy site must be upheld. Any change or perceived change to this delicate balance has the potential to escalate, not only within the occupied Palestinian territory and Israel, but also across the region. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations supports all diplomatic efforts for parties to resume a credible political process that will lead to the end of the occupation and just and lasting peace in the context of a two-state solution. In this respect, we welcome the discussions and important understandings reached between senior Egyptian, Jordanian, Israeli, Palestinian, and United States officials in Aqaba, Jordan, and Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, earlier this year. We urge all parties to take concrete steps to implement and extend the commitments made. 
the deepening occupation, settlement expansion, high levels of violence against civilians, including acts of terror, and critically, the absence of political horizon continue to undermine the hope of reaching a political solution to the conflict and ending the occupation through the achievement of a two-state solution with Jerusalem as the capital of both states, in line with relevant United Nations resolutions, international law, and bilateral agreements. The United Nations remains committed to supporting Palestinians and Israelis to achieve this goal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, thank you very much, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Khaled Dikhiari. We thank you for your message and support to the cause of the Palestinian people. And please convey to the Secretary General, the committee's inflinching support for his, uh, to, to his our gratitude for his inflinching support to uh, the efforts to find a just and peaceful resolution uh, to the question of Palestine. I can see uh, on the screen also the uh, chair of the uh, Special, the UN Special Committee on Israeli Practices, Ambassador Mohan Puris, welcome. I can also see the uh, Ambassador uh, Permanent Observer of uh, the OIC, welcome, welcome, sir. So now let's move on, and I will give now the floor to uh, His Excellency Mr. Ali Gutali, uh, speaking on behalf of the Assistant Secretary General for, of Palestine at Puts Affairs of uh, the OIC. Uh, Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Your Excellency, Ambassador Khan Khiari, representative of the UN Secretary General. Your Excellency, Ambassador Sheikh Nyang, Chairman of the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People. Your Excellency, Ambassador Dr. Riyad Bansour, Permanent Observer of the State of Palestine to the United Nations. Dear moderator, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like at the outset to extend the OIC's deep appreciation to the committee on the exercise of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people and to all members of its bureau for their efforts to support the just cause of Palestine. I also wish to avail myself of this opportunity to pay tribute to the UN Division for Palestinian Rights for their commendable work to ensure the success of this important meeting, which consecrates one of the aspects of partnership and mutual cooperation between our two organizations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we meet today to discuss Israel's colonial settlement policy in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem which continues to persistently violate international law and UN resolutions, including the, United, the UN Security Council's resolution number 2334 of 2016, and undermined the territorial integrity and contiguity of the Palestinian state. The OIC reiterates its call for all, its call on for an immediate and complete halt to all Israel's illegal colonial settlement activities. The OIC welcomes in this regard the recent publication this month of an update, the United Nations database of businesses facilitating Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory issued by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and also welcomes the UN resolution in this regard requesting its yearly update. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation expresses its appreciation for the recent European Parliament's position, calling for EU member states to recognize Palestinian sta statehood, ending settlement activities, and supporting the International Criminal Court's investigation into war crimes and the crimes against humanity, committed in the occupied Palestinian territory. We call on EU countries to implement these recommendations. Excellencies, we reaffirm that the intensity of the Israeli violations of international law commence 
a paradigm shift in international intervention and actions. It's not acceptable that Israel continues to behave as a state above the international law and to perpetrate its crimes with full impunity. The OIC reiterates in this regard its call on the international community to pressurize Israel, the occupying power, into ensuring compliance with and respect for its obligations under international law, including the Fourth Geneva Convention, and taking decisive action to hold Israel, the occupying power, accountable for all its crimes and violations, including its illegal colonial settlement policy. Israel's de facto realities and unilateral actions on the ground aimed at changing the legal and historical status quo of holy places, repeated aggression against Al-Aqsa Mosque, as well as altering the Arab character and demographic imposition of the occupied East Jerusalem are nil and void, according to international law and UN resolutions. We forewarn, we forewarn that the continuation of such Israeli violations against holy places would expand the scope of the conflict to a religious dimension, dimension with far reaching repercussions on peace and security in the region and beyond. In closing, I would like, on behalf of the OIC, to reaffirm the full, the full support of this organization for the Palestinian people in their endeavor to regain their legitimate and inalienable rights including their right to self-determination, sovereignty, and independence in their state, in the territory occupied since 1967, with East Jerusalem as its capital, and to reach a just solution to the plight of the Palestine refugees in line with the United Nations Resolution 194. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Butali. Uh, the thanks talks of your statement uh, really demonstrates the unwavering support of uh, the OIC uh, for the Palestinian cause. And I would like to see this opportunity to this opportunity to really uh, uh, once again uh, praise you for your commitment uh, in our <coughs> cooperation uh, with uh, the committee on the question of uh, Jerusalem and on. Uh, question of Palestine in general. I recognize uh, on the, the screen some colleagues. I would like to send my greetings to them. I can see Ambassador Tarek Lodet of uh, Tunisia, Ambassador Faisal, who is the Vice Chair of the Committee, uh, Ambassador Petro of Malaysia. I can see also many colleagues representing uh, uh, members of the, uh, of the committee here. So my warm greetings to, to all of you. Let me now give the floor to uh, His Excellency Mr. Riyad Mansour, Permanent Observer of the State of Palestine, the United Nations. Excellencies, Excellency, you have the floor. Minister Mansour, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and also, I want to join you in welcoming uh, all the uh, colleagues, you know, Khaled representing, you know, the UN and the G, and Ambassador Ali representing the OIC, uh, the panelists, uh, the moderator, Sister Noor, and uh, the representative from the family of Sob Levan, who is with us. We uh, are proud of that family, and uh, we stand with them and we admire. Uh, their steadfastness and their resilience in uh, fighting for their rights their home occupied institution. Allow me at the beginning, you know, to express the gratitude to the State of Palestine, uh, to the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People, and the OIC for continuing with this very important tradition of having this annual international conference on uh, the question of Jerusalem. Allow me also to express our uh, thanks uh, to the division uh, who are uh, tediously involved 
in all of the details to make this uh, conference a successful one. Of course, uh, this time, because of the realities of uh, aftermath of COVID and uh, the extreme uh, easy load of our work at the UN, it deprived us from doing the conference in one of the continent, in one of the countries as we have done in the past, in Africa, in the Middle East, uh, Europe, in uh, Asia, and in the capital of the country, Mr. Chairman, as we have done uh, in the past. Hopefully, uh, starting maybe next year, uh, the situation allowing, we will go to that tradition of uh, doing these conferences uh, in uh, these different countries, mobilize the maximum amount of support for the people of Palestine and the residents, the Palestinians, uh, residents of uh, the occupied uh, Jerusalem. Now, having said all these things, uh, allow me also to share with you that there is tremendous amount of frustra frustrations and anger among the Palestinian people and their leadership uh, because of the prolonged uh, period of time since the Nakba, more than 75 years, and since the occupation, 56 years, without seeing uh, the end of the tunnel in sight. In the contrary, they are living through a more complicated and deteriorated situation than the years before. So instead of seeing uh, the accomplishment and the attainment of their inalienable rights, including the right to self-determination to the independence of their state, which is Jerusalem as its capital, and the return of the refugees to their homes and property in accordance with international law and relevant UN resolutions. They see the belligerence and the extremism uh, reaching extreme heights uh, among the Israeli government, which is the extreme, the extremist sense, the establishment of the state of Israel, and containing within it uh, fascist elements who are assuming very important role in the Israeli cabinet, such as the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry and the Ministry of Internal Security. Uh, this situation is making the Palestinian people in general, in the occupied territory, including East Jerusalem, and in uh, the occupied Gaza Strip, uh, to face an unprecedented belligerency of this uh, occupation, its government, and the extreme settlers who are openly advocating uh, the elimination of towns such as Uwara or Tor Messiah, and the Israeli current government is uh, in the process of establishing a militia of about 20,000 from those settlers in order to intensify the aggression against the Palestinian people and the negation of their existence in the occupied territory, including East Jerusalem, and to continue the inhumane, illegal, and immoral blockade against our people in the Gaza Strip. Of course, the battle in uh, East Jerusalem is reaching a very, very high level because uh, the, the finance minister, uh, Smetrich, who adopted a plan in the year 2017, 2018, when he was a member of the Knesset, and recently was published to English in its entirety, and it is being circulated extensively. He is advocating in clear terms, in this historic land, there is no place for two people or two nationalities or, or two national expressions to exist. Only one is to 
uh, manifest itself between the river and the sea. And that is the Jews of Israel and Israel itself. Palestinians, either they accept the role of being subservient without any national aspiration or right, or they will be ethnically cleansed and uh, pushed out of historic Palestine to the Arab countries or to any other place that they can go. Those who would continue to struggle for the two-state solution and for the attainment of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people for uh, self-determination, for uh, statehood, and for the return of the refugees, according to his, his uh, book or booklet or analysis, they are terrorists and the security forces of Israel will be with them. This reminds us of the situation that existed hundreds of years ago in Spain when the Muslims and the Jews then had to face one of three options, either run, convert, or you will be. This is the essence of a, a key, the, the essence of the plan of a key member of Mr. Netanyahu current government. So therefore, the frustrations and anger by our people and leadership, we are sick and tired of listening to a repetition of reiteration of positions while we see the house being burned without taking practical steps. So therefore, our people are asking everyone, international community, the UN, Security Council, General Assembly, implement your resolutions. Don't keep repeating to us that you are for the two-state solution. You call in Israel to stop settlements. You call in Israel to stop demolitions. You call in Israel to stop uh, uh, transfer of people outside their properties. That is not resonating in the heads and minds of Israeli leaders. You are capable of taking practical measures starting with implementing your resolutions, followed by accountability and those who do not honor and respect international law and Security Council resolutions and UN resolutions should face consequences in order to increase the chances of stopping them from destroying the two-state solution, from trying to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians from East Jerusalem and to make all of Jerusalem as a Jewish uh, city in complete contradiction with the trends of history for more than a thousand years in which Jerusalem was an Arab town with uh, Islamic and Christian flavor. Now we also ask our brothers and sisters from the Arab countries, from the OIC, from NAM, from European countries, all those who also adopt very positive positions, reiterating similar thing to what my brother Khaled reiterated on behalf of Secretary General, that is not sufficient. That is not enough. That is not changing the course. Because to keep repeating the same thing that is not changing reality, in a positive direction, expecting that it will is an exercise in futility. We have to resort to different methods. We have to resort to practical measures. This is the, the, the feeling and the message of the Palestinian people. And that's why I said there is tremendous amount of anger and frustration because how long do we have to keep telling the Palestinian people wait and wait and wait and wait, we're approaching almost now uh, 80 years since the Nakba. We are approaching more than 56 years since occupa uh, occupation. And we keep telling them, in essence, wait. Wait is not an option. We need to see a change of course now. 
and we see we need to see it in a practical way. Of course, we are going to the ICJ and we will be submitting our written submission in a few days, along with about 50 countries, which we appreciate the fact that they are willing and ready to have their submission sent to the ICJ and the ICJ, which is the highest legal court in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the world and the highest legal system in the United Nations. Uh, we hope that it will, stipulate, it will spell out the legal consequences of this prolonged occupation, which is illegal, this uh, annexation, including of annexation of East Jerusalem, which is illegal, and the threat to annex the so-called Area C, which would be also illegal, in addition to the settlement being illegal, and the settlers settlements are illegal, and therefore the settlers are individuals who are involved in an illegal uh, you know, uh, activities, then we hope that the ICJ will tell us what would be the legal consequence, consequences based on all these things, including practicing apartheid and having a system of apartheid against our people in the occupied territory and on the other side of the green line, we want, we hope, the ICJ will say to all of us, states, UN system, United Nations, as to what would be our responsibilities based on the legal consequences of such violations of the rights of the Palestinian people, denying them the right to self-determination, which is a cardinal principle in the charter of the UN and also allowing and admitting the acquisition of land by force, which is another violation of a cardinal principle in the charter of the UN. Enough is enough. We need to see practical steps by everyone, small steps, big steps in order to make this very vicious, Israeli occupation to get the message and to stop from uh, the continuation of all these uh, breaches and major breaches of the rights of the Palestinian people and international law in order to possibly have a just solution that will fulfill and allow for the attainment of the Palestinian people of their own rights. I cannot really face people who are fed up and frustrated and angry and give them weight and give them more, you know, uh, reiteration of uh, what we've legislated at the UN. They tell me, and they are right, we need to see results. We need to see changes on our life and on our flight on the ground. And as long as the occupation there, we are living through hell. And if you want us to get out of that situation, help us in practical ways of putting an end to this occupation as quickly as possible so that the Palestinian people, including our people in occupied East Jerusalem, live freedom and dignity. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Minister Bansour, I thank you uh, very much for framing the issues uh, for today's uh, event. And I would like to seize this opportunity to once again uh, say how much we appreciate as a committee uh, the inspiration you are for us. You, uh, all your team, Ambassador Feda, and all the staff uh, of uh, the Mission of Palestine, we appreciate your courage, we appreciate your combative spirit, the firmness and consistency of your position. Uh, we appreciate uh, uh, your resilience uh, in face of uh, blatant and unabated violations. Uh, and of that uh, mindset you have, uh, which is consistent not yielding uh, to reality which the occupying power wants to impose on us, which is to renounce to a solution, 
and to all the international parameters and question of Pakistan. So we thank you for, for that attitude you have, and, uh, and thank you uh, for the statement you have just made. <clears throat> and now, let me let us now move to our panelists. Each panelist will have roughly 10 minutes. If you can do it for less than 10 minutes, that's fine, but 10 minutes should be a maximum. So first, I will give the floor to Mr. Munir Museba, who will be presenting on the uh, bureaucracy of occupation in Jerusalem and best legal practices for Palestinians in Israeli courts. Mr. Nuseba, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, it's an honor to be uh, with you and with uh, um, all of the distinguished uh, representatives of states and international organizations, as well as with the distinguished uh, speakers who will speak today at, uh, at, at this panel. Uh, it's really an honor and thank you for uh, organizing this event. Um, so I will be um, uh, speaking about this um, bureaucracy uh, that the Israeli legal system creates in order to uh, continuously dispossess and displace uh, Palestinians um, and focus on the legal system that uh, allows all of this displacement and dispossession to be so powerful and so continuous uh, and never ending, um, and the immense risk that this uh, uh, imposes uh, on the Palestinian uh, people in occupied Jerusalem. Um, but um, uh, before I start doing this, I need to remind and reiterate what uh, the status of Jerusalem is. I know that several of the distinguished speakers have mentioned this, but it's also important for me uh, to remind that uh, Jer Jerusalem and the entirety of Jerusalem is occupied uh, uh, in 1948, 1967. The United Nations until the current day uh, uh, does not recognize Israeli sovereignty over uh, the holy city of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, the UN Security Council in 1980, um, uh, among many other resolutions, uh, issued an important one, uh, where uh, Resolution 478, which uh, in which the UN Security Council uh, determined that all legislative and administrative measures and actions taken by Israel, the occupying power, which have altered or purport to alter the character and status of the holy city of Jerusalem, and in particular, the recent basic law on Jerusalem are null and void and must be rescinded uh, forthwith. So uh, to the international community and international law do not recognize the applicability of Israeli law, uh, the occupying power on Jerusalem, um, and it does not uh, recognize the uh, jurisdiction of the Israeli court system uh, on that part of the city. However, because Israel has gone forward for the past decade without uh, really being accountable before the international community and without facing any uh, serious consequences for its continuous um, uh, violations of international law, it has uh, continuously um, uh, imposed the Israeli legal system uh, in Jerusalem. And this Israeli legal system consists of um, a number of laws that are extremely discriminatory. Um, for example, uh, I will mention only three out of many uh, 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 discriminatory laws, but I will mention three that will be relevant uh, to my talk. The absentee property law of 1950, the administrative uh, confiscation for public use, and the legal and administrative matter law of 1970. Um, um, a, few, a few months ago, a couple of months ago, actually, the UN commemorated the Nakba uh, in an important event uh, uh, in the General Assembly. And uh, at this moment, it is very important to remember that the Western part of Jerusalem uh, was totally uh, ethnically cleansed of Palestinians and Israel after displacing all of the Palestinian uh, people from the western part of Jerusalem, uh, it uh, um, uh, also dispossessed them from their uh, property 
using the absentee property law of 1950, uh, which is, was also used in other parts of uh, uh, mandatory Palestine to uh, give the Israeli government and the Israeli state institutions uh, the land on which it managed to, uh, uh, you know, build the state on the one hand, but also to absorb more and more Jewish immigration uh, um, and uh, change the demographic character uh, of the areas on the expense of the Palestine refugees who were forcibly uh, displaced uh, from their homes. But the Nakba did not end in 1948. We, are, we have been since then talking about uh, and experiencing what we call the ongoing Nakba, uh, which is the exercise of uh, continuous displacement and dispossession uh, of Palestinians from their homes. And certainly, Jerusalem, Al-Quds, is the city where uh, we uh, were several measures and laws are, are, are used uh, for this uh, ongoing Nakba. Um, in addition to the absentee property law that, was, that has been used since 1950, um, the uh, legal and administrative uh, matter, uh, sorry, the administrative confiscation for public use law were used extensively in the aftermath of the 1967 occupation of the eastern part of Jerusalem. Uh, after that uh, occupation, Israel confiscated 30% um, uh, or one third actually to, of, of the overall territory of the eastern part of Jerusalem in order to build illegal Jewish only settlements uh, and neighborhoods uh, in, 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 in that part of the city. Um, but the battle, uh, if I can call it like that, that we are witnessing today in the Israeli legal system uh, are more focused on the legal and administrative matter law, uh, which I'm sure if Mr. Sublaban is going to speak, he's going to explain some aspects of this, uh, of this law and of his own family's experience uh, with this law. But we have also been, in addition to individual families suffering from uh, this law, we have been seeing uh, whole neighborhoods that have been uh, 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 suffering from the implementation of this law. This law allows uh, 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 Jewish individuals or organizations to claim lands and houses in the Eastern part of Jerusalem where Palestinians uh, uh, currently live and where there is a claim that these houses belong to Jews uh, before 1948. While Palestinians are unable to claim their homes and their lands in the western part of Jerusalem and in the areas that went under the Israeli sovereignty uh, in 1948, uh, the law only allows the Jewish population to make, uh, to make this claim. And this has been an active uh, um, court battle since uh, 19, uh, uh, you know, since 1970 and the early 70s. Uh, for example, Sheikh Jarrah, the uh, issue that has been uh, famous uh, in, uh, in, in international media, there are 20 houses that were built by the UNRWA, the United Nations uh, uh, Relief and Works Agency for the Palestine uh, uh, Refugees, uh, where um, uh, uh, the UNRWA built these houses for Palestinian refugees who had been displaced from the western part of Jerusalem as well as uh, other cities in the areas that uh, uh, Israel conquered in 1948. Then there was this uh, um, uh, settler organization that did not really prove any link, link to the land itself uh, who uh, uh, claimed the land and started a legal battle uh, in the Israeli uh, legal, uh, uh, in the Israeli courts in order to um, claim these houses. The Palestinian families have been suffering in this bureaucracy now for decades um, and uh, um, uh, continuously, uh, while at the same time they, they do not even ag accept uh, the, fa the, the claim that this organization has uh, an, any ownership over the land or that even this land was had been owned by Jews before 1948. Uh, but at the same time, they have continued to struggle and the, the fact that they managed to uh, get their voices 
to be heard internationally uh, helped specifically with this case. Uh, and while it is not still over uh, um, until today, it's not closed, but they have managed to buy some time uh, by uh, convincing the court, I think because of the international pressure as well, that it will have to wait uh, for a few more years uh, until the issue of ownership, ownership is settled. In Silwan, on the other hand, for example, in Batn al Hawa, which is one of the different neighborhoods within the uh, bigger uh, um, Silwan uh, neighborhood, uh, so smaller smaller communities within, within Silwan, Batn al Hawa, Hawa is one of them, um, the Israeli uh, so called general custodian uh, uh, transferred uh, 5.2 dunums uh, of land to the uh, Benveniste Trust, which uh, claimed uh, this land, despite the fact that the Palestinian families who live on these land uh, managed to prove to the Israeli court that the Ottoman law uh, that was used at the time when uh, uh, certain Jewish families lived in that uh, area in the past did not recognize their ownership of the land, but only their uh, tenancy and uh, uh, title to the houses themselves, the Israeli court, uh, court kept the uh, ownership of the Benveniste Trust uh, to the land. And now there are cases that risk 81 Palestinian families of uh, uh, imminent displacement. Uh, um, basically, 436 Palestinians are, are at uh, this risk of forcible uh, eviction and displacement. I would like to, uh, to conclude with um, an important point. These three laws that I've mentioned, but many, many other laws the uh, Palestinian Ministry of Justice uh, earlier uh, if, if, over the past few years has uh, uh, documented uh, uh, with the help of civil society the discriminatory Israeli laws and it documented uh, over a hundred uh, uh, legislations as well as hundreds of Israeli military orders that folk that are very discriminatory against Palestinians and that result in all of these of, of these displacements and dispossessions, as well as many other violations, all of this is part of the apartheid regime that Israel is uh, um, uh, committing uh, and organizing on both sides of the Green Line uh, within the, its sovereign territory and also in the occupied Palestinian territory. And uh, in in my opinion, it is very important that the UN General Assembly should start addressing uh, more actively and more explicitly the apartheid issue. And uh, one way that has been suggested by a number of human rights organizations, as well as Professor Michael Link, the former uh, special rapporteur on the occupied Palestinian uh, territory, was to reactivate the, uh, Palestine, the apartheid committee and center uh, in order to allow for further investigation uh, of uh, the crime of apartheid in Palestine. So if, you know, I will end here with this recommendation, which I, I believe a coalition of Palestinian civil society, uh, as well as uh, the uh, uh, PLO, uh, the PLO relevant body uh, in, in the sense um, of, of the revival of this, of, of this committee, and certainly addressing the, uh, the crime of apartheid uh, in Palestine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Museva, for your account and for describing uh, the daily challenges in uh, East Jerusalem and navigating uh, through the bureaucratic maze in Israeli courts. We also uh, heard your recommendation, which has also been uh, made by uh, many other sources, and the recommendation will be uh, duly uh, 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 examined within our committee. Uh, thank you so very much for for your account. Now I go to uh, Mr. to Dr. Dirk Baum, who will be discussing uh, Palestinian economic activism and uh, resilience in East Jerusalem. Uh, Dr. Baum, I have the pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I was invited to speak about the role of corporations and the private sector in the occupation of East Jerusalem. I've started doing uh, research into corporate complicity 
back in 2006, as I was part of the Coalition of Women for Peace in Israel as an Israeli activist. And at the time, uh, I think we were shocked to find out that nobody else was doing this research. Uh, looking around at uh, resources, official and unofficial resources, there was nothing on it. And so this is how a grassroots uh, activist organization took on the task of mapping the entire industry of the Israeli occupation. Um, today, it's almost uh, 18 years later, uh, still the organization that we started then, Who Profits from the Occupation, is the one uh, real, uh, reliable, uh, extensive resource about corporate complicity in the Israeli occupation. So on the one hand, I'm, I'm very proud of that, of being one of the co-founders of that organization, but also I'm, I'm quite disappointed in that. I think our hope was that this task would be taken on by um, other larger institutions, universities, and also private sector act actors, uh, data providers that are professionally providing information about corporate um, uh, malfeasance and complicity in human rights violations all around the world. But during these last years, whenever a corporate data provider would take on this task of providing this information, they would be targeted by uh, Zionist supporters who would make them stop. So in fact, we see that now 18 years later, still the sources for this information are just from civil society and from grassroots organizers on the ground. Um, corporations are of course involved in all aspects of the Israeli occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid, anything from building settlements directly to providing the military with um, um, uh, the tools and the technologies and the methodologies, and also um, the privatization of state operations uh, in, in uh, managing, controlling, uh, dispossessing, and destroying uh, the property of the civilian population under occupation. Uh, I wanted to show you three of our uh, main resources for you to use if needed. I will share my screen for a little bit. Uh, one of them is, of course, Who Profits. Who Profits has become a, an independent research center on the Israeli occupation and corporate activities, whoprofits.org. It contains, I think, about 500 companies now in specific categories of involvement. Another one is our own resource published now by the American Friends Service Committee that I work with. It is called investigate, investigate.info. This is a database that activates who profits data, expands it, deepens it specifically for investors. So specifically with publicly traded corporations. Again, a service that I wish would have been provided elsewhere. And the third that was actually mentioned earlier today uh, is the, uh, the list or database published by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, following the resolution of the Human Rights Council of 2016. I want to stay with that for a moment. These are the categories that were part of the mandate of this report. The report was published in 2020, so four years after the resolution, and it was supposed to be updated annually. It included 112 companies, only 112 companies, which is quite surprising. I told you who profits has over 500, but we thought it was okay because it was supposed to be updated annually. We knew that they were very low on resources, the, the team that was working on it, and that they could not ascertain or, or figure out some questions uh, that they got from companies. And we thought that any company missing will be added in the next year but it was actually not updated until this last month. Um, this update was actually quite uh, surprising because we, none of us, uh, you know, there was no call for submissions to civil society. And in this update, 15 companies were taken off the list. That's it, no other companies were added. And they were taken off the list because of mergers and acquisitions and name changes, all sorts of technical reasons and also five companies that actually left the settlements. 
but other companies that are very much involved all these years, very publicly in the settlements, were never added in. And that is a problem. It is a problem because of all the lists that I've shown you, of course, the UN list is the most prominent and, and, and uh, respected one. And when companies that are very active in settlement production, in settlement construction, are not mentioned on the list, this gives them, in a way, permission to continue doing what they're doing. Um, I'll give you two examples of such companies. Uh, one of them is a company that was on the original uh, UN database that published in 2020, General Mills. It's an American corporation, and they used to source some of their products from a factory in Atarot Industrial Zone. Atarot Industrial Zone is just outside East Jerusalem, and it was annexed to Israel as part of the annexation of East Jerusalem. So by Israeli law, Israel sees it as a part of the state of Israel, but it is a, a settlement industrial zone, of course. And uh, thanks to the publication on the UN database, uh, we were able to launch a campaign in, in uh, 2019, I think, no, 2020, shortly after the publication. And the campaign went into 2021, 2022, we actually got the, the a, a, a official statement by the company that they would stop sourcing those products from the factory in the uh, occupied industrial zone, which was a great success. But it is not unique. Uh, we know of about two dozen multinationals that have stepped away from their involvement in settlements thanks to such campaigns. And the reason why is because this is a very large controversy in a very small country, in a very small area, and therefore very small uh, profits for a large multinational. And that is the point of this. The point of this is really not to destroy companies, but to make them better and to appeal to their policies of business and human rights. Uh, the next uh, example I want to show you is a, a recent report published by Who Profits. I want to encourage you all to check it out on, online. Uh, it was published in February and it looks into the role that corporations have in imposing the Judaization of Jerusalem. Judaization is a horrible word, but it is the official term used by the city of Jerusalem and by the state of Israel uh, for policies that are about uh, uh, reaching some kind of a demographic threshold of increasing the Jewish population and decreasing the Palestinian population in the city. They actually have uh, uh, percentages goals. And in this report uh, delineates uh, bureaucratic processes that include uh, the, um, the need of Palestinian residents in East Jerusalem to prove their right to residency occasionally uh, every seven years or so, and in order to not lose their residency and their health insurance and uh, uh, rights to um, social security that is also taken away arbitrarily sometimes as a punitive measure, as well as a, a new a process of registering land and property that is discriminatory against the Palestinian population to make sure that uh, they won't be able to register their property and therefore hold on to it. And looking at the companies mentioned by who profits in that report, these companies cannot be listed in the UN database because the UN database actually focuses solely on the expansion of settlements and the direct means of security that are used in order to expand settlements and move population into the occupied area. So here I will uh, say that we actually need to expand the scope of what we look at when we look at corporate accountability uh, in Palestine, Israel, and look at the crime of apartheid, I'm adding my voice to the voice of uh, uh, Mr. Munir Nuseba and others, many, many others. We are looking at a much wider scope that is necessary here because the framework of occupation and settlements is just not enough to understand the situation in East Jerusalem. And we need to look at how corporations are involved in the restrictions of civil liberties and in the unequal uh, and discriminatory legal and uh, um, practices and processes that are imposed on 
the population in East Jerusalem as well as inside Israel. Judaization is in fact official state policy in other parts of the state of Israel, in the Galilee, in the Nakab, and so on. So uh, I will uh, end here and just add my voice to the idea that uh, this might be a good time to reinstate a special committee against apartheid, to investigate the crime of apartheid in the 21st century everywhere around the world, including in Israel-Palestine, and with it also the role of corporations and their commitments to human rights in the state of apartheid. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Baum. And I would like to uh, really con congratulate you and your organization uh, for taking the lead uh, on a path which has been untrodden uh, before you before you stepped in. I think you have uh, clearly indicated uh, the role of businesses, business enterprises, uh, uh, the, the role in being uh, complicit uh, in what you call the industry of Israeli occupation. So thank you for opening our eyes on uh, all uh, those aspects. And also we heard your recommendation and uh, the committee uh, will, uh, will, will register it and see uh, what uh, decision uh, they will take about it. So I thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, I now go to uh, our next panelist who is uh, Mr. Josh Wagner, uh, who will be sharing his views on the role of the US Congress uh, to, bring, to, bring, to bring about change. Uh, Mr. Rubna, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. His Excellency, Mr. Sheng, Mr. Sheikh Niang, Chair of the Committee of the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People and Permanent Representative of Senegal to the UN. His Excellency, Mr. Khali Khiari, Assistant Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs at the United Nations. His Excellency, Mr. Ali Gutali, on behalf of the Assistant Secretary General for Palestine and Al-Quds Affairs of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. His Excellency, Dr. Riyad Mansour, Permanent Observer of the State of Palestine to the United Nations. Distinguished delegates, Excellencies, fellow panelists, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this important conference. I'm Josh Rubner, Director of Government Relations with the Institute for Middle East Understanding, a US-based nonprofit founded in 2005 by a group of concerned Americans who wanna foster an increased understanding among Americans about Palestine and the Palestinian people. Distinguished committee members, before we discuss what the US has, and more importantly has not done, to stop Israel's illegal colonization of Palestinian land and occupied East Jerusalem, we must situate both Israeli and US policy in a broader context. For the past 75 years, Israel's settler colonial laws, policies, and practices have sought to uproot and dispossess the indigenous Palestinian people from their homeland. Israeli settler colonial laws, policies, and practices frequently fit the definition of apartheid as enshrined in the 1973 UN International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, which as we know is defined as a crime against humanity in the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Today, based on meticulous research and well-founded legal analysis, we now have a wall-to-wall -wall consensus among Palestinian, Israeli, and international human rights organizations, such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, that Israel is guilty of practicing the crime of apartheid. However, with very few exceptions, over the past 75 years, not only has the United States failed to sanction Israel for its brutal settler colonial and apartheid policies toward the Palestinian people. But by providing Israel with nearly unconditional military and diplomatic support, the United States emboldens and entrenches these policies, making the US complicit in Israel's crimes against humanity toward the Palestinian people. 
U.S. support for Israel's racist apartheid rule over the Palestinian people was on full display this week in Washington, D.C. President Biden welcomed Israeli President Isaac Herzog to the White House on Tuesday. Before his meeting with President Herzog, President Biden did not utter one single word supporting Palestinian rights. Can you imagine, Your Excellencies, the president of apartheid South Africa being welcomed to the White House? In fact, it wasn't until 1919, only after President F.W. de Klerk had committed to a process of dismantling apartheid, that a South African president was afforded this honor. Also later that day, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a resolution declaring that Israel is, quote, not a racist or apartheid state. Distinguished ambassadors, your excellencies, I would submit to you that in the last bastion of support for Israeli apartheid, the U.S. Congress, that it was felt necessary to dis- to suspend disbelief and pass this resolution, that this constitutes a profound discursive loss for Israeli apartheid. Only a country that is guilty of racist apartheid policies needs the U.S. Congress to pass a resolution to the contrary. And yesterday, Congress gave bipartisan standing ovations to President Herzog in his joint address to Congress, in which he, of course, said nothing about ending Israel's illegal colonization of Palestinian land, ending its brutal military rule over millions of Palestinians deprived of all human rights in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, ending its denial of the right of Palestinian refugees to return home after 75 years of exile at the hands of Israeli settler colonialism. This is the broader context of support for Israel's racist and apartheid rule in which we have to understand U.S. policy on the question of Jerusalem, and specifically on the question of Jerusalem. It's important to note that the Biden administration has not taken one single step to reverse the Trump administration's radical disregard of 70 years of UN and bipartisan US policy. The Biden administration has failed to reverse the US declaration of Jerusalem as Israel's capital and has failed to take any steps toward removing its embassy back to Tel Aviv. On the contrary, the Biden administration is moving forward with plans to build a new and expanded permanent embassy in Jerusalem. And to make matters even worse, One of the sites planned for the new embassy, the Allenby Barracks site, is slated to be built on land that Israel expropriated illegally from Palestinian refugees, including from U.S. citizens. So not only is the Biden administration moving quickly to make permanent the U.S. embassy in Jerusalem at the expense of the rights of Palestinian refugees, it has also failed to fulfill a very simple pledge to reopen its consulate general in Jerusalem, an institution that existed as an independent diplomatic conduit between the United States and the Palestinian people for more than 100 years before the establishment of the state of Israel, until it was killed off by the Trump administration. And as Israel has continued to dispossess Palestinians in various Jerusalem neighborhoods, such as Silwan, Sheikh Jarrah, the old city, Khan al-Ahmar, to name just a few. The Biden administration has done nothing more than offer lip service, refusing to sanction Israel as is required by U.S. law for using U.S. weapons to destroy Palestinian homes in Jerusalem and throughout the West Bank and to force Palestinians off of their lands. Yes, it's true that dozens of principled members of Congress have authored multiple letters over the years protesting U.S. support for Israel's ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from Jerusalem, most notably letters pertaining to the demolition of homes in Wadi al-Humus, led by Representative Ro Khanna, 
and the expulsion of Palestinians from Sheikh Jarrah, led by former Representative Marie Newman. However, both the Trump and the Biden administrations have not even bothered to respond to these congressional concerns, much, much less take any action to halt Israel's illegal use of U.S. weapons to enable Israel to continue its ethnic cleansing and illegal colonization of Jerusalem. So yes, much work remains to be done in the U.S. to end our complicity in Israel's racist and apartheid regime of rule over the Palestinian people, both within Jerusalem and throughout all of historic Palestine. But we've already made important strides. Growing numbers of members of Congress are naming Israel's policies as apartheid. Members of Congress, both Palestinian and Jewish, Representative Rashida Tlaib and Senator Bernie Sanders boycotted President Herzog's speech. And perhaps most importantly, public opinion is growing ever more supportive of Palestinian rights and aware of Israel's apartheid policies. For example, an April 2023 poll by the Brookings Institute found that 21% of Democrats believed Israel to be, quote, a state with segregation similar to apartheid. And only 3% believed Israel to be a vibrant democracy. In other words, seven times the number of Democrats believed Israel to be an apartheid state. Just as the US was one of the last countries to end its support for apartheid South Africa, sadly, we will also be the last to end our support for apartheid Israel. But that day will come, and your countries can help in that process. Distinguished ambassadors, excellencies, let me close with two requests of the member states of this committee. Number one, in your diplomatic interventions, please consider a démarche to the United States protesting our support for Israeli apartheid and urge the United States to fulfill its third party obligations to suppress and punish perpetrators of Israeli apartheid. And number two, I join with my fellow panelists in urging the committee to seek the revival of the UN Special Committee Against Apartheid to report regularly on Israel's apartheid policies toward the Palestinian people and to make effective recommendations for the international community to end Israeli apartheid, including placing an arms embargo on the country. With these steps, UN member states supportive of Palestinian rights can help civil society in the US and throughout the world to end our complicity in Israel's apartheid regime. Let us rise to that occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Robna. First of all, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for your question uh, for justice in general, uh, your question for justice in Palestine, and uh, for lasting peace in the Middle East. Uh, I think your statement we just heard is very compelling as it shows uh, how uh, U.S. policies and Congress legislation, how the executive branch and Congress conduct uh, can be instrumental to, to, to bring about change. Uh, we also heard your two requests, and I thank you for your contribution. So this brings us to the conclusion of uh, uh, our initial presentations. Uh, but before I move to Mrs. Noura Rafe, I recognize uh, on the screen uh, my friend Ambassador Majid Abdelaziz, uh, own observer of uh, the League of Arab States, which is uh, another vibrant partner of the committee. So welcome, uh, my dear friend, uh, Ambassador Abdelaziz. Now I'm going to turn to uh, Mrs. Noura Rafe, uh, who will discuss. Uh, her experience also in promoting the Palestinian rights. After that, she will engage uh, with the panelists and elicit more insights from them. Mrs. Arafe, thank you for joining us, for being with us. Uh, you have the floor. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, um, um, Your Excellencies. Good afternoon to those in a different time zone. And thank you so much, uh, Munir, Dov, and Josh, uh, for your presentations. So I have the role of a discussant in this panel. So I will briefly provide my perspective and try to summarize the three very insightful uh, presentations that uh, were made. And then I will ask some follow-up questions um, to the panelists. So I think, in summary, we can all agree on the big picture. Uh, Jerusalem is a microcosm of Israel's apartheid regime and its settler colonial project that seeks to displace the Palestinian population and expropriate their land to expand Jewish domination over the city. And this settler colonial project um, is a continuous practice. It's not just about one event that happened like the Nakba or the occupation in 1967, we're rather talking about a structure. And in Jerusalem, Israel's goal has been to transform the city from a multi-religious, multi-cultural city into a reunified Jewish city under exclusive Israeli uh, control and sovereignty. So as a historical force, uh, settler colonialism in Jerusalem, as in the rest of Palestine, has been underpinned by different logics that I would actually like to highlight as a summary for us to understand what we're dealing with. And here I want to draw on a book, um, a very good book actually by John Collins, entitled Global Palestine, in which he identified the different logics in which uh, settler colonialism is grounded. So the first logic to understand Israel's enterprise is the logic of elimination. The main idea here is elimination of the indigenous society in order to replace it with a new settler society. And that has been at the core of Israel's uh, project. Um, Theodor Herzl is known for a saying, um, and I'm quoting him, if I wish to substitute a new building for an old one I must demolish before I construct, end of quote. And in Jerusalem, the elimination of indigenous presence has taken different forms. Not all of them are physical or happened by force as in 1948 when Arab villages in the western part of Jerusalem were emptied or when, for example, the Sublaban family and other families in the um, old city of Jerusalem were expelled to eliminate in Palestinian society, Israel has also assimilated or tried to assimilate or incorporate them into the polity as the threatening others who should be under constant uh, surveillance in order to ensure Israel's, um, Israel's domination. And here, this, this assimilation has been conditional on one important demographic principle that uh, several ambassadors mentioned in their uh, statements, which is that Palestinians must be the minority to secure Jewish control over the city. The second important logic underpinning Israel's project is the logic of expansion. And here we're talking about expansion and access to land. That's why in 1967, Israel redrew the uh, municipal boundaries of Jerusalem and illegally annexed more than 70 square kilometer of West Bank territory, including East Jerusalem. And it did so while making sure to exclude the highly populated uh, Palestinian neighborhoods by annexing the neighborhoods with a smaller uh, number of, of Palestinians. And the establishment of illegal settlements, which is the main theme of this, uh, of this conference, has also been uh, um, an important tool to facilitate uh, territorial um, acquisition. The building of the wall as well, another demo important demographic measure to enforce um, um, Israel's de facto political borders of Jerusalem. The third logic, and I'm trying to be very brief, is that of denial. It's about denying that there were indigenous people on the land before the establishment of Israel. And that's why we have the creation of myths 
that have been central to the Zionist project, like the myth about a land without people for a people without land. Um, Munir talked about Batn al-Hawa in Silwan. The logic of denial there is, 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 is outstanding because you have Israeli right-wing settler organizations trying to manipulate history and archaeology as powerful political tools to recreate and remanufacture Jerusalem as a Jewish city. Unfortunately, we won't have the time to go into details. The fourth and last logic underpinning Israel's project is the logic of exceptionalism. The moral force behind Israeli policies, especially in Jerusalem, has been the sense of Israeli Jewish exceptionalism as exemplified in the claim that Jews are the chosen people. So all these logics that ground Israel's project in Jerusalem and its vision to Judaize the city by ensuring and expanding Jewish control and monopoly over life, land, the economy, politics, terminology and history while further evicting and dispossessing Palestinians. And all this is happening within a larger context characterized by a leadership, political and institutional vacuum, Palestinian vacuum in Jerusalem because the Palestinian Authority has no sovereignty. There's institutional, institutional atomization. And there's also a sense of abandonment from um, felt by Palestinians from the regional and international community. And Ambassador Riyad Mansour has alluded to the disgruntled of Palestinians, especially given the culture of impunity um, enjoyed by Israel. So despite more than seven decades of UN resolutions, states have failed to safeguard uh, the rights of Palestinians, uh, both in Jerusalem and across Palestine. And they have also failed to hold Israel accountable for the um, several illegal uh, policies and actions that affect the daily lives of Palestinians, but also have far reaching political, legal, social and economic ramifications. So I think this conference can be an opportunity for us um, to um, and here I want to join um, um, and to second what Mr. Riyad Mansour said about the importance of um, uh, taking practical measures uh, to have an impact on the ground and to hold Israel accountable. So with that, I'm gonna now, in the 15 minutes that we have left for this, for this panel, I'm gonna ask the uh, panelists some follow-up questions to engage with them on some of the points uh, they made. And here, Munir, um, I would like to start with you. So you, um, as in, in addition to Dov and uh, myself and, uh, and Josh, uh, um, used the apartheid uh, framework. Um, and at the end of your presentation, you mentioned that it's, uh, it's, um, it's very important to, uh, uh, to understand what's happening in Jerusalem. So I was wondering if you can elaborate uh, on that on, and on the significance of using the apartheid framework to uh, conceptualize and understand um, uh, what's happening in Jerusalem. Thank you very much, uh, Noor. Uh, indeed, the Palestinian, Israeli, and international civil uh, human rights uh, uh, community has been working uh, on analyzing the regime that we live under. And there is a consensus today that we are living under an apartheid regime. I personally, uh, one of the things that I do in Community Action Center at Quds University is that we provide legal aid uh, to Palestinians in Jerusalem. And we touch this apartheid regime on a daily basis. We may, may spend years uh, working with the family in order to help them to live under the same roof, uh, you know, a husband and the wife to live under the same roof. We may spend years with the, with, with the family in order to make sure that their child has the right to live with them uh, uh, in the same house and also has the right to uh, uh, be part of the social welfare system of the uh, medical insurance and uh, and to go to schools and to just do the things that are taken for granted uh, in the rest of the world. This is because the uh, Israeli uh, regime 
um, works as everybody else mentioned actually on Judaizing uh, uh, Jerusalem and therefore will put a lot of obstacles for every individual and every family to be able to live uh, in the city with, with rights. Uh, this is the, the experience is totally different when it comes to a Jewish uh, person, Israeli living in, uh, in Jerusalem, but not only Jewish Israeli citizen, uh, you know, like with child registration, for example, while we may spend many years to register a child and we may succeed and may, we may fail, um, uh, any Jewish person, even if the parents are not uh, 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 citizens or residents of Israel, born here will have the right to get Israeli citizenship only because it's a Jewish person born here. And this is only an example, and I've talked earlier about uh, housing and uh, land rights and displacement and reclaiming your own house and reclaiming your own land and refugees' right of return. And, you know, the list is very long. The list is really long. So uh, it is apartheid. It's not only racial discrimination. Maybe racial discrimination to one level or, or another exists everywhere around the world to some level or another, right? Every state, there is some level of discrimination here and there. But the, the situation here is much worse. It's the illegal system that is continuously discriminating uh, in order to create this domination and hegemony uh, of one group over the other. And so this is the first point. The second one is um, Israel is in a perfect comfort zone today. Everyone uh, reiterates the support for a two-state solution, um, the support for Palestinian rights, but at the same time, we are unable to find tools that will take us away from, um, you know, uh, from words and, you know, great resolutions with great language have come out of the General Assembly of the Human Rights Council. And even as uh, Ambassador Mansour mentioned earlier from the Security Council, uh, but until today, we are unable to move from language to implementation. The, the significance of the apartheid framework is not, that it is not a normal violation of international law. It is a crime against humanity. Um, it is, uh, and, and the remedy for this is to dismantle the features of the apartheid regime. The world was very aware of this when it came to South Africa and Namibia, by the way. I think it's very important to say that apartheid is not only applicable uh, in situations of, uh, you know, in, 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 in sovereign territory, but it's also applicable in occupied territory, as we saw in Namibia. So South Africa, apartheid South Africa uh, applied this regime in both areas, in the occupied territory as well as in its sovereign territory. And this is what Israel is doing at the same time. So by saying apartheid, we're not really suggesting uh, any political solutions. This is not a political term, but it is really indeed a legal term that requires legal action and political action that will support this legal action. We need the General Assembly to start engaging with apartheid. We need the General Assembly. I know the complexity, as uh, Josh really explained with the US uh, support and complicity with the apartheid regime, I, I'm, I'm very doubtful of, 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 uh, uh, of, of any uh, Security Council action that may happen in the next few years, but I am very optimistic, I should say, with the General Assembly uh, being able to start addressing apartheid as apartheid and, uh, you know, not only as, uh, uh, as, as a state that is doing violations. Similarly, in the Human Rights Council in Geneva, I think this is very important. This will um, make it more uh, uh, persuasive for third countries to take the relationship with Israel more seriously, to think about it, to think about how, what the relationship should consist of and what it should not consist of, uh, similar to the situation in South Africa. I am aware that during the apartheid regime in South Africa, at the beginning, there were powerful countries that supported this regime, but the, at the end of the day, with a strong anti-colonial movement uh, in the world and the strong um, uh, movement towards justice uh, coming from Africa, coming from Asia, coming from other parts of the world, from uh, Latin America, eventually everybody, uh, even in the countries that supported the apartheid regime, they were persuaded. We are hoping that a similar scenario will happen. And this is a peaceful way forward. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, Munir. So I want to draw on uh, your last point uh, mentioning South Africa because um, you, Josh, and Dov, um, uh, when discussing what has to be done, you highlighted uh, the importance of reviving uh, the UN Special Committee Against Apartheid, which was originally established in the early 60s uh, to review developments um, in apartheid South Africa and to promote um, an international campaign against apartheid. Um, and I have to mention actually that the call uh, to revive this UN committee um, has been a grassroots popular uh, demand. Um, and a couple of days ago, uh, 250 uh, civil society organizations around the world called on the UN to um, investigate Israel's apartheid. My question to all of you actually is, how do you envision the work of this committee? What would be its mandate? Who would be part of it? And my other question is, why would it be important to revive this committee? And how would its work differ from the work of other committees and mechanisms that work on Palestine at the UN? So I don't know who would like, maybe um, Josh Munir or... Dov, I have a specific question to you about the UN database, so I don't want to <laughs> exploit you, but anyone like um, who can just elaborate more on the vision, the mandate of this committee, why it's important? I can, I can try an answer here. I think it would be very important for the UN to reestablish this committee because I think what's very important about the apartheid framework is that it provides us with a very holistic way of understanding Israel's policies of oppression toward the Palestinian people that are not only restricted to the occupied Palestinian territories of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. So when you look at the totality of the reportage that has come out from Palestinian human rights organizations, from Israeli human rights organizations, from international organizations and even some UN bodies. It's very clear that apartheid is a system that Israel has imposed on the Palestinian people from the river to the sea. And there is, to my knowledge, no standing working UN General Assembly committee that deals with the totality of Israel's oppression toward the Palestinian people. So I think from this perspective, the reestablishment of this committee would be very important in this regard, especially as many, many analysts are coming to the conclusion that the time for a two-state resolution to the conflict is not feasible any longer. And if indeed that is the case, we do have to do a better job of integrating into our analysis of ending Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people factors such as Israel's blatant discrimination and apartheid laws against Palestinian citizens of Israel. As Adala has noted, there are more than 65 laws on Israel's book that discriminate either implicitly or explicitly against Palestinian citizens who are supposed to have equal rights under Israeli law, but obviously do not, uh, according to, to these various laws that are documented by Adala. And I think it's worth noting just one of them, the nation state law that was passed in the last few years, which states very clearly in a quasi-constitutional way that only Jewish people can enjoy self-determination between the river and the sea. This is a clear apartheid law that has the status of constitutional law within Israel's judicial system. So, this is one of the main reasons why I think it's important to establish this committee, to look at the totality of uh, Israel's uh, oppressive apartheid and racist policies toward the Palestinian people, including towards Palestinian refugees who are denied their right to return home after 75 years of exile for the sole reason that they're Palestinian in violation of international law. And then I would also say that it's Additionally important to reestablish this committee because we need more specific, more concrete recommendations for things that can be done either unilaterally by UN member nations or in a multilateral forum that will somehow get around the US's inevitable veto in the Security Council. 
Uh, and I think this goes back to the imperative of looking at some of the tools that were used to bring about an end to apartheid in South Africa, which again, included comprehensive sanctions on apartheid South Africa, including an arms embargo. So I think that the establishment of this type of committee, the reestablishment of this type of committee could be very important in terms of generating the ideas and initiatives that would mirror some of the uh, sanctions and tools that were used to help bring about an end to apartheid in South Africa and replicate it in the case of Palestine, Israel. Thank you, uh, Josh. So I'm aware of the time, but I have one last question to, to Dov, specifically about the UN database, which you mentioned in your presentation. So um, as Mr. Ali Gutali mentioned, um, Palestine this month initiated a resolution at the Human Rights Council uh, to trigger more money and resources um, so that updates of the UN database are published annually and the resolution passed. So what impact do you think the step uh, will have? And my other question is, um, when once we know that um, X company is complicit in uh, Israel's um, settler colonial apartheid project, how can we influence the company to step away and to change gear? Uh, thank you, Noor. I will start with the second question uh, because this is what we have been doing for, for two decades, two decades now. And when I say we, I am speaking for a very weird and amorphous movement of people all around the world uh, that have very little in common, but are uh, uh, part of that effort. Sometimes the mere publication of the, and the exposure of companies as being complicit in Israeli crimes is enough. Because as I said, this is a highly controversial issue, highly divisive issues in many parts of the world and multinational or corporations that have business in different parts of the world do not want to be identified with the Israeli occupation and settler colonialism. Mm. That's enough. So the publication in itself is a very powerful action in the world. It isn't, it isn't an action that says, you know, in some circles, the UN database was presented as a blacklist. It is not a blacklist. It is not a blacklist because it is not a specific call for action. It doesn't tell people don't, don't have any relations with these companies, not at all. In fact, in some cases, it says the opposite. Please use whatever leverage you have with those companies as investors, as consumers, as business partners to influence them to step away from their involvement in those human rights violations. So in a way, I just want to clarify the word divestment that we've been using a lot is not about divesting from those companies, but it is about using whatever means we have to influence those companies to divest from Israeli occup occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid. So making them better in a way. And therefore the uh, annual update of the database is crucially important, especially since as I spoke yesterday or yesterday <laughs> earlier, uh, there are no such mainstream readily available resources for institutional um, parties that can be organizations, states, cities, investors, and so on. And so the UN database in that regard is crucially important. It needs to be updated annually, and it needs to be expanded extensively to actually include all the companies involved in uh, those 10 uh, uh, lined items that I've showed you on the slide that are part of the mandate of the database. But that mandate itself needs to be extended even further because we cannot anymore look only at settlements as the main crime that we are trying to track. We Thank should you. be tracking the involvement in, in all the aspects of Israeli apartheid. Thank you so much, uh, Dov. Thank you, Munir. Thank you, Josh, for your presentations, for your engagement with the questions. Uh, there's a lot to discuss, but unfortunately, um, we don't have enough time. So I will hand it over now to Mr. Chair to, um, as we have some questions from member states and others in the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Arafe. Thank you for your initial very enlightening presentation tomorrow presentation followed by the very pertinent question you asked uh, the panelists in for eliciting a very brilliant exchange. I thank uh, all speakers for the insightful comments and personal perspectives and for the passion uh, to find quickly a solution to the question of uh, Palestine. I'm now going to go to the last uh, segment of our meeting, which is the comments and questions segment. 
I will first give the floor to committee members and observers, as well as also with the, to the OIC and League of Our States, uh, if they want to take the floor. And after that, I will go to the audience. So just please signal if I see you, I can give you the floor. Committee members, uh, League of Arab State, OIC, if you want to take the floor. Okay, I can see my friend Majid, and then Kuba. Okay, uh, Majid, Ambassador Majid Zalaziz. And, and also I would like you to, to be very brief uh, because we have only 10 minutes left, so please understand us. So you can unmute uh, Ambassador Abdelaziz. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Ambassador Nyang, and um, and uh, thank you for convening this meeting um, um, uh, on the eve of the debate in the Security Council next week about the question of Palestine. I think it's timely. It's very important that we debate on, on the situation. And thank you to Ambassador Mansour and to um, the brilliant uh, three uh, panelists and the brilliant discussant for all the for all the, the information that they provided i think um, there there is a, a debate now between whether it is security council or general assembly now it is still the security council and we have to put a lot of, of pressure on the security council and on the secretary general and not let them off the hook and uh, because that that would be uh, 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 dangerous only to move to the General Assembly. Of course, the General Assembly is a very important uh, organ, but uh, its resolutions will take much more longer time to implement and much more um, uh, 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 effort in order to garner support um, around it. And particularly when it comes to the issue of re-establishing the Committee on Apartheid. Uh, this is this was a committee that was created in the 60s and i was here in the un at these times and um, and uh, and uh, uh, it had the, there has to be some sort of a recognition at least by judicial uh, authority that there is a case of apartheid i mean we all agree among ourselves that what the israelis are doing is apartheid but when we came to put the word apartheid in the resolutions last year in the General Assembly, we were confronted by the European Union saying, where, where, where is the document or where is the judicial basis to say that this is apartheid? In the case of South Africa, there is an advisory opinion saying that what South Africa is doing by the court is apartheid. And that makes me say that we have to concentrate in our submissions to the ICJ in the in the in the case of Palestine on this issue and on the case so that it comes out from the court uh, a recognition that there exists a case of apartheid i don't really care about what the congress says or that this is a local local propaganda because the president of israel is here and standing ovation in the congress and others so they are just trying to see but what 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 concerned me is the decision that is going to come out from the ICJ. This is where we have to be uh, uh, pushing for in our submissions and in our oral submissions. That is going to be the next uh, uh, the next stage. And um, and uh, while we're talking in the general in the Security Council, the issue of the settlement, the issue of the protection of Jerusalem the issue of the protection of the Palestinian people. Uh, resolution 904, Resolution 478, the report of the Secretary General of 2018 about uh, mean, means and ways of protecting uh, the, 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 the Palestinian people. All these will have to utilize and will have to raise the bar to the, to the, to the level that there should be some sorts of, um, of uh, 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 of response from the Security Council and the Secretary General, and we keep the General Assembly as a last resort if we have to. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Majid, for your very insightful uh, views you have uh, shared with us. You have the knowledge, you have the experience, you have the expertise, and we are looking forward to working with you to advance uh, the cause of the Palestinian people. Uh, thank you so very much. So I give the floor to uh, Ambassador Yuri Gala, uh, DPR of Cuba. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, Ambassador Chekdiak, Chair of the Committee. Thank you and good morning to you all. 
First, allow me to thank the committee and the OIC for organizing this important event. And I'd like to also uh, express our appreciation for the uh, speakers who uh, took the floor on this important matter. Here, we have seen an escalation of aggression against the Palestinian people who continue to suffer from the Israeli apartheid practices and systematic violations to their human rights on a daily basis, as, as has been pointed out. We, as you know, share, have rejected Israel's decision to accelerate progress on its plans to build settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. The demolition of Palestinian homes, man's disposition and forced displacement of Palestinian civilians. Now, we, um, on, against this backdrop, we will kindly ask uh, panel, uh, panelists um, what else can be done to try to achieve full respect of international law and the UN relevant resolutions pertaining Palestine. The, uh, we know the positions already, but if we could uh, get additional comments on that, we will really appreciate. And once again, we call on the international community to really shoulder its responsibilities to provide international protection to the Palestinian people and to exert pressure on Israel to cease its repeated attacks on innocent civilians and infrastructure. I thank you, Chef. Thank you very much, uh, my dear colleague, Ambassador uh, Gala, and thank you for the uh, continued commitment of Cuba to uh, the Palestinian people. I'm now going to give the floor to Mr. Rafat Sublaban. You remember I talked about uh, the Sublaban family who has been living in Jerusalem and which have been fighting in the Israeli courts uh, since 1978 uh, against the eviction from, uh, from, 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 from Jerusalem. So you have the floor, Mr. Rafat. Good to see you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, Excellencies, the distinguished speakers. My name is Rafat Sublaban. I'm a Palestinian human rights lawyer from occupied Jerusalem. For over 12 years, I've documented human rights violations inflicted upon Palestinians by the Israeli occupation, including, among others, killings, arrests, demolitions, and forced evictions. In addition to being part of the human rights movement, myself and my family are also victims of human rights violations by, the, by Israel's regime of apartheid and settler colonialism. For over 47 years, my family has faced repeated harassment, lawsuits, and attempts by Israeli authorities and settler organizations to seize our home. On the morning of 11 July 2023, Israeli occupation forces forcibly displaced my elderly parents and seized our family home in the Muslim quarter of occupied Jerusalem's old city. They came at 4.30 a.m., broke the door using some machine, and forcibly removed everyone inside. My 73-year-old father was given two minutes to collect his medicine and a few items. Our furniture and personal belongings remain held by the settlers inside the buildings. The house was rented by my maternal grandparents from the government of Jordan after they were displaced from West Jerusalem uh, during the 1948 events. After Israel's illegal annexation of East Jerusalem in 1967, Israeli authorities started attempts to evict my family, sparking a decades-long struggle against attempts to remove us and replace us with Jewish settlers. These attempts involved several uh, Israeli governmental bodies, including the custodian of, general, of public property, the municipality, Jerusalem municipality, and other bodies, including the Antiquities Department, the uh, Social Security Institute, and more recently, the Ministry of Interior. All of these bodies work hand by hand with Jewish settler organizations with the aim and, with the aim and mandate of forcibly displacing Palestinians the forcible transfer of Palestinians from East Jerusalem and increasing the demographic, changing demographics of Jerusalem by increasing Jewish presence. After uh, 47 years of, of court proceedings and struggle by my family, Israeli courts ruled to evict my parents, while earlier in 2016, the courts of the Israeli High Court of Injustice banned us, myself, and my siblings from living with my elderly parents and taking care of them. Two years after, the settlers filed a new case and came back to evict my parents, resulting in the most recent eviction that took place as I said on the 11th of June. We paid rent, we were good tenants, 
but that means nothing to Israel. Our only fault is being Palestinian. When you're Palestinian, Israel's legal system, its authorities, army, police, and settlers are all working together against you. Our entire neighborhood in Jerusalem's old city is under the same risk by the same settlers, working under the name of several trusts, organizations, and companies, including some registered in the US. Dozens of properties were already seized in our neighborhood since the 1970s, and more are being seized today. The settlers actually call our neighborhood in the Muslim quarter the new Jewish quarter. Their plan is expanding the Jewish quarter into our neighborhood. In total, 218 families in East Jerusalem are under the same threat of displacement, and tens of thousands of homes across the OPT are under the risk of demolition. This is ethnic cleansing, forcible transfer, slowly being committed in a widespread and systematic manner. It's happening in East Jerusalem, in Khan al-Ahmar, Masafir Yatta, South Hebron Hills, Nablus, in occupied Syrian al-Julan, but also in 1948 occupied territory in Al-Naqa, Ba'akka, Yafa, and more. The Nakba, which started in 1948, is not a singular historical event, but an ongoing process of settler colonialism aimed at forcibly transferring, uprooting, and dispossessing the Palestinian people. This justice continues to affect us today, the ongoing Nakba, while the world, is either, the world is either silent or complicit. We deserve, no, we demand justice, freedom, and dignity. This oppression has lasted 75 years too long. It's time for the United Nations and the international community to act towards ending and rectifying this grave historical injustice. We're tired. This has been happening for 75 years. We demand an end to it. Thank you, Your Excellencies. I uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rafat Sabsubluban, for your for coming to this uh, meeting and uh, for sharing with us this very chilly, chilling account, uh, which is emblematic of uh, the uh, continued violations, illegal activities uh, organized and supported by the Israeli uh, government. Uh, my uh, message to you is uh, keep up the combative spirit in fighting for your family, but also in your daily work as a, as a, as a, as a lawyer. So thank you for coming to us. Really appreciate your time and your presence. Uh, now I'm going to uh, share with you some questions which have been uh, raised by members of the audience. Um, I will start by uh, question which has been asked by questions asked by uh, Ganyu Siaka Baba Tunda, who is a PhD student at the University of Cyprus. The question, first question is, okay, his question is, can the court find a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I have a question from Abdelaziz Kony from the Republic of Mali. What are the next steps the diplomatic community will take to prevent Israeli settlements in the OPT. We have a question from Philip Benitz in uh, the US. Uh, as Ambassador Mansour had mentioned, the need for practical measures. So his question is, what action will member states take and how can civil society help? Uh, so I think basically those are the questions which have been asked by the audience. I would ask the panelists to be very brief, and if those questions have been addressed, not to respond to them, but uh, just to be very brief, maybe one minute each. Thank you. Who can start by responding? Just unmute and, okay, I can see Munir. Munir, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. And maybe I will address the one about the uh, court. Um, certainly we do not uh, expect the court itself to uh, be able to resolve the palestinian israeli uh, conflict however the uh, advisory opinion that will be uh, uh, found by the court will be very important uh, it is certainly expected um, uh, that the court will find that the occupation uh, the israeli occupation in the occupied palestinian territory is illegal i think this is uh, uh, an easy conclusion to make, given all the violations of international law that this occupation is conducting. Uh, I also believe that the court uh, will um, find 
that um, there is an apartheid uh, regime being conducted. Uh, and um, uh, I think this conclusion will be very important and very powerful and we need it. It will not be a solution in itself. However, it will be part of the diagnosis. And uh, certainly once we diagnose the issue, we will be able to more easily and more quickly uh, uh, reach the, the, uh, the end. And that's why I believe what the court will find uh, is extremely important. And uh, all of us uh, in the human rights community, whether in Palestine or abroad, are looking at the court and looking at the procedure, uh, procedures uh, and waiting for uh, uh, the result. Um, thank you. I can go next and just add that it is kind of an odd thing for me to call for an establishment of a committee. I find that not to be an action. So responding to the question by uh, Phyllis Dennis. Uh, however, we are all desperate to find ways to move into action because of the present political conditions around the world. And uh, the clear acceptance of the definition of apartheid for the regime now in Israel is a, an opportunity that we need to use. And in the case of looking at corporate accountability, uh, once corporations are named as complicit in those crimes, uh, the UN itself already has mechanisms of asking states to uh, require their companies to comply, for example, with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. It's a very basic demand, or even to uh, withdraw its own activities and businesses from such companies if they don't. So even that would be a a first action that can move many, co many, many corporations out of their complicity. I'll add in very quickly that I very much agree with Ambassador Abdelaziz on the importance of having a GA referral to the ICJ on the question of apartheid in particular. I think that would be a very important practical step. I think it would also be a practical step for the GA to pass a resolution encouraging countries to impose an arms embargo, a bilateral arms embargo on Israel and to stop doing business with Israeli weapons manufacturers whose profits are increasing every day as we speak. So I think those are two uh, things that can be done immediately. And of course, member states of this committee could be encouraged to have their national legislatures pass uh, arms embargo into their national law. I think that would be a step that would really place a lot of pressure on Israel to end this apartheid regime. Yeah, very briefly, I completely agree with Josh as, a, as an answer to Ambassador Yuri Gala on what can be done. Um, I think so far Israel has not been forced to end its um, or compelled to end its system of injustice because the um, benefits are much higher than the cost. And we need to reach a point where the costs of its apartheid settler colonial regime um, is higher than the benefits. And this will come, this will happen when the culture of unconditional impunity that Israel enjoys uh, comes to an end. And this happens when, for example, we have the arms embargo, when we hold um, Israeli companies um, and other international companies accountable. Um, this can be like some brief practical measures, um, but they, they will gradually uh, start increasing the cost of the occupation. It, material cost, but also reputational, uh, in terms of the reputation as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Arafe. And I, I thank you very, very sincerely and warmly our audience for the three excellent questions they have asked, and which have enabled us to have very clear answers from uh, our panelists. And those responses you provided uh, will be also uh, shared with uh, uh, the, uh, the committee and then we'll see what actions are needed to be taken afterwards. I'm now giving, going to give the floor for a very brief conclusion of this uh, meeting. The last speaker uh, will be uh, uh, Minister Riyad Mansour uh, to share his final thoughts. You have the floor, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all of the uh, presenters, you know, and Noor and uh, my brother, you know, from the family of Levan for his uh, excellent uh, presentation. We are all working for the same cause, but we are using different approaches. And the fact that this committee is 
organizing these events to give opportunity to people like you and many others come and express your opinion to the international community and to exert pressure are practical steps in the right direction. And uh, with regard, you know, to apartheid, we took a significant step in that direction through the formulation of the questions in the General Assembly, which adopted that resolution for the ICJ well on including the system of discrimination, which we hope that they will articulate that there is apartheid there, and that is a crime against humanity, and it should be dismantled. Of course, you know, if the court to uh, give such an advisory opinion, it will not resolve the question or stop the system immediately. But it is a very important, as Munir said, step in the right direction. Our brothers and sisters in South Africa and the media went to the court utilize it in this fight against that evil system, and they succeeded, number one, by the resiliency and the steadfastness of all their people, and we, the Palestinian people, are like them, and also by the massive support from the international community, whether at the level of civil, you know, civil society organizations or countries. We are following the same. The structures that we need to do, we will build these structures. Some of them we have in place. For example, the continuing committee to investigate the Israeli practices on both sides of the Green Line. Continuing. That is a new uh, method or a new structure that did not exist during the time of apartheid in South Africa. The Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights, where it will bring, will bring you to share your ideas. It brings leaders from Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Salem, and Al Haq, and others who are, you know, uh, they gave brilliant analysis about apartheid in our land. The fact that we have a committee like this and bring those people to share their ideas is part and parcel of spreading that there is something happening in Palestine. Do we need additional structures? I think collectively we will come up with what is needed, but believe me, we have enough structures as of now. What we need to concentrate is to keep the advocacy, uh, you know, against apartheid in Palestine and against apartheid in both sides of the Green Line. And the, the more we continue advocating in that direction and, you know, isolating the Israeli occupying authorities, the more that we will be getting closer to really giving justice to the Palestinian people and the attainment of their rights. I promise you that we will do everything that we can. It is true in the General Assembly, we have a healthier environment supportive of the Palestinian people because many of the countries who uh, constitute membership of the General Assembly are similar, like us. They fought colonialism and succeeded in having independence. We are the last kid left behind, and our day will come with the effort of our people, with their steadfastness, with their bravery, with their resilience everywhere, in Gaza, in Jenin, in Nablus, in Hawara, in uh, Jerusalem, and Tormus Aya everywhere, and people like you, and, and people like Sheikh Niang, and this committee, and people hopefully in the ICJ who will read all of the submissions, including our brilliant masterpiece submission. And we are proud of the lawyers who are working with us and the political team of Palestine to really represent the case of Palestine in the best possible way so that we can influence the honorable judges in the ICJ also to step up uh, to, to the plate. Of course, we bank a lot on what is happening inside the United States and the movement among students and in the civil, uh, civil rights movement and in, in many places, including the very few in Congress. 
but also the general atmosphere among the American people side of justice for the Palestinians. We are not orphans anymore. We are Palestinians. And we have so many friends like you. And we thank you for being with us and the march. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Minister Mansour, for your wise, uh, very inspiring comments. We have now come to the end of uh, our, our event. I thank you all for your active participation today. And I thank you for also those who have been intervening uh, through uh, social media. Uh, your uh, accounts, uh, dear panelists, and, uh, uh, and all other who have taken uh, the floor here uh, have been really enlightening and uh, have highlighted the situation of Palestinians in the of the land occupation. The Secretariat will uh, prepare a summary of these deliberations that will be posted uh, on the committee's website and disseminated by, uh, via social media. I thank very warmly once again the division for its assistance, always uh, very efficient. Uh, you can follow the committee on Twitter. You can join our mailing list and visit the UNISPAL website, www.un.org slash UNISPAL. You can do it to stay up to date with the committee's activities and receive uh, regularly our newsletter. Uh, we look forward to your ongoing engagement and we uh, and to welcome you in our future activities. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.